Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll check out an interactive map that shows the impact of last month's Gold King mine spill. Also tonight, how local researchers are involved in a mission to find water on the moon. And there's a new report out today on childhood hunger in America's suburbs. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The Department of Public Safety is now reporting 11 shooting incidents along I-10. The latest occurred this morning near 83rd Avenue and involved a shattered windshield and possibly a BB gun. Information leading to an arrest or indictment in the case is at $20,000. And a federal judge heard arguments today in a lawsuit filed by the Tohono O'odham Tribe involving a casino near Glendale. The tribe is asking for an injunction that requires Arizona officials to stop trying to block the casino by not allowing a full casino license. Lawyers for the tribe say the casino will open in December with bingo style machines, but they can't have other forms of gaming without that license. The Arizona Geological Survey has launched an interactive map that tracks water samples from the Gold King mine spill, which dumped three million gallons of the contaminated water down the Animas River in Colorado, water that eventually found its way to Arizona. Here with more on the tracking map is the Arizona Geological Survey's Brian Goatee. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Great. Let's, let's get an overview first of all here, the Gold King mine spill. What exactly happened? Well, about five weeks ago, there was a large spill at the Gold King Mine north of Durango, Colorado. And so uh, contractors with EPA were trying to uh, work at the site and accidentally released about three million gallons of contaminants. And so these contaminants uh, went into Cement Creek, which eventually flowed into Animas River. And as far as Arizona water, how much was threatened? Well, actually, there, the evidence showed that none of the water that reached the Lake Powell area showed any signs of contaminants. Now, is that a, a done deal or could we still see some in the future? Well, it's possible that some of the contaminants that are trapped in the sediment in the San Juan and the Animas Rivers could actually be released during a flood event, but that's one of those things that you just continually monitor for. And as far as monitoring water analysis, when was the water analysis? We're going to look at the map here in a second. When was, were, were these analyses taken? Well, the, the samples uh, were collected from shortly after August 5th, and I believe on the 5th or the 6th, all the way to the present. I believe the last samples collected were in late August. So the information is still being updated? Yes. And as far as uh, where they were taken, uh, anything in particular? What, what are we seeing out here? It, that's what the map will, will show us is the, the full extent of the, and the scope of all of the data collection process. But they've been, the samples have been collected from the mine source of the contaminants all the way down to the Animas and the San Juan and the Colorado River and into Lake Powell. And the lowest extent that's being sampled for is uh, near Lee's Ferry at the base of uh, Glen Canyon Dam. Interesting. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the map. What exactly are we looking at here? Okay, so the, the map is a, it's a web service that we created to showcase data that is collected from uh, eight agencies, federal, state, and tribal agencies. And so the purpose of this map was to uh, utilize all of these multiple data sources into one-stop shop for data. And so the map shows the, uh, a, map, a Google map base, which shows the extent of where all the samples were collected. And on the left side, we have a series of toggles, on and off switches, uh, that showcase the, the, the parameters of the data. So you have reporting agency over there, reporting authority, I should say. Sample type, you got water and sediment, correct? Yes, that is correct. So we can toggle, on the top left you have all the reporting authorities that have committed to, to providing data uh, from August 5th uh, to, to the present and into the future. We'll continue to collect data and showcase these data sets. And so they range from federal EPA, water quality data sets, USGS will come online uh, shortly, and then uh, state agencies from Utah, New Mexico, and Colorado and Arizona. Can well. we? I know that the ADEQ is up there somewhere. Can we see you exactly what uh, if you if you? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so we can turn off all of the the other agencies here, and this allows us to see the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality have collected two samples. One from the uh, it will tell you if you actually click on this this upper sample. Uh, yeah. This was it tells you the sample number, the ID, when it was collected, the coordinates and then also it was collected from the water intake at the dam, 
uh, is this a water sample or is it a sediment sample? And then a link to the AZ, uh, Arizona Department of Environmental Quality's website and then a link to the actual data itself. There you go. So this allows you direct access to uh, all the major basic data types. Now, it, when, it, when it says the arsenic, the cadmium, and the lead and the mercury not detected, that does that mean, okay, other sites, they did find some of those uh, contaminants, but not here? Or does that mean that it's like no information? Yeah, that's a great question because um, really a lot, there were more than four contaminants that came out of this mine spill. And these four in particular were EPA selected four of these top metals that were considered a, a, a high risk to health and safety. And so these four parameters were collected early on and they are continue to be collected. And so there are exceedances uh, for each of these contaminants that go beyond the maximum contaminant level. Mm -hmm. And so if you, you the, the site allows you to zoom back out and reset and then, for example, if you're interested, well, where was cadmium? Uh, where did that show up in this oh, map? See. You'll see, see that it showed up in Colorado only, where it, it exceeded the EPA maximum contaminant level. And so these are just exceedances for those four metals. As far as how you want folks to use this map, what's, what's the goal? I mean, this is, this is a lot of great information. Uh, I think fortunately, not much of it is in Arizona, thank goodness, but I mean, there's still information there that's important. How do you want folks to use this? Well, there's, it's, it's a multifunctional tool. It allows, number one, uh, the federal and state agencies to actually uh, work together and showcase all of their data in one place. Uh, before this site was available, you had to go to six, seven, or eight different agencies to find these data. And so if you're a stakeholder or a user in this Colorado River system, it, you really have to look around all these different data sources to find that. So this allows, the, number one, the agencies to work together, and number two, to at least uh, show and educate the public that they have this data available, they're working on it, these are the data, and this is allows them to actually see where the contaminants are showing up, when did they show up, and who collected them. And again, you can uh, check that out and the information is being updated. So if you want to find the latest information, just go there, I guess, day to day or how often you see fit. Uh, yeah, that's true. And, and you, you, it's always the, the great resource of this site is it allows you to access to the other entities yes. and the, the data sources so you can check their website. Yeah you know, for any other data. Well, it's, it's very interesting stuff. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Great. Thank you, Ted. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the aid insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. Tonight's edition of Arizona Technology and Innovation looks at a locally based effort to find water on the moon. ASU has been selected by NASA to lead a mission that will produce the most detailed map to date of the moon's water deposits. ASU geologist Craig Hardgrove of the School of Earth and Space Exploration is the mission's principal investigator. I think you actually proposed this too, didn't you? I did, yes. Yeah, well, congratulations <laughs> on you. that. This is, this, we're talking about a Q, lunar cube set. Right. So what are we talking about? It's a spacecraft the size of a shoebox, uh, so it's, it's one of the smallest spacecraft that we've sent out in the solar system that we hope to acquire some data that's on par with what we've sent with the large uh, planetary science missions. 
And yes. we were talking the lunar polar hydrogen, is that what it's called, the hydrogen mapper? Hydrogen mapper, yes. So we're going to use a pair of what's called neutron detectors to look for water that's in these permanently shadowed craters at the South Pole. So there's por portions of the South Pole that never see sunlight, ever. And we think that there's hydrogen and bound up in water ice down in there. And so because we can't really easily see with a flashlight or anything like that, we want to use these interesting techniques called neutron detectors to figure it out. Inter and I want to get to that aspect of it, but back to the, the spacecraft, I think we have a shot of this thing. Yep. You're saying that it's actually the size of a shoebox? It's a big shoebox, yeah. It's uh, maybe the size of an NBA or NFL football player shoebox, but yeah, and it has deployable solar panels, and so it's a little bit of a spring to action once we are deployed from the main rocket. But yeah, you can see the solar panels on the side, a camera, and the neutron detectors we mounted there on the now, face how, closest. How heavy is that thing? Um, somewhere around uh, 10 kilograms or so. Uh, yeah. Okay, how heavy is that thing? <laughs> uh, I don't know. How many it's, pounds? It's a conversion there, I don't know. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, as far as what it's made of, what's it made of? Uh, aluminum, probably, yeah. Uh, mostly aluminum. It's going to be very light. And so uh, we're, we're in there. And there's also the detectors themselves are made of some materials called uh, scintillators. So they'll be plastic and all the components are be space hardened, ready for space flight. So there's some components that you'd be familiar with, like computer boards that'd be in your personal computer, um, ready for space, obviously, and, and other uh, elements in terms of the optics of the camera and, and uh, heaters yeah. and other various components that you would normally see in a spacecraft just shrunk down to fit inside this shoebox. Cost. Cost um, or something like so that. So the, the cost is going to be on par with something that's like 1 to 10 percent of a typical NASA discovery mission. So this is a very new field that NASA is exploring in terms of ex uh, the, what we can do in planetary science. Well, it's very new, but it sounds like it's very effective, too. I mean, this could be quite the efficient way to get out there into space. It's very targeted, yes. Uh, we're, we're hitching a ride on what's called the Space Launch System. It'll be launched in uh, 2018. Uh, it's NASA's new rocket that'll send astronauts to the moon, to Mars, and beyond. And so we're, we actually have, there's a CubeSat launcher that's built into, in between two of the stages. And we'll be mounted in there. And it'll be, when we get to the moon, they're going to do just like Apollo when we did a figure eight around the moon. Similar type of procedure. When we get really close, we'll dump off all the CubeSat experiments. And uh, I think several of them, not just ours, are bound for lunar orbit. So I think there's three or four of us. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, as yeah. far as detailing uh, a map of the moon's water deposits. Now you mentioned you're gonna focus there on the South Pole. Uh, is that just simply because it never seems to get any sun? Um, there actually, there are areas of the North Pole that are the same, but we wanted to optimize. We wanted the largest areas possible and some of those are at the South Pole. And we wanna optimize the amount of fuel that we have, have available. It's a small spacecraft. So in order to get into a very stable orbit, we needed to get into an elliptical orbit. So we're actually gonna skim very close over the South Pole and we'll be very high up above the North Pole, thousands of kilometers above the North Pole. And that actually helps to stabilize us and we can use less fuel. So we'd like to get both poles, but we picked the South Pole because it was a more appealing target. So when you're skimming over the South Pole, and I think we do have some shots here as mm -hmm. well of the lunar surface, and, and you're looking down through the shoebox yeah. at, at the lunar surface, how do you know what to look for and how do you know what to map? Yeah, so the, the cool thing about neutron detectors is there are neutrons leaking out of every planetary surface that doesn't have an atmosphere. Um, and the energies of those neutrons tell us about how much water is down there, how much hydrogen really, and we just say that that's bound up in water. And in the case of the moon, we think it's water ice, and that could be deposited on, in those permanently shadowed craters from um, passing asteroids or comets or implanted by solar winds. There's a lot of reasons it could be there. Um, but one of the really intriguing things on that map, you can see a dot that says L-cross L impactor. There was a small spacecraft that rode along on LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, that actually crashed into that crater, oh into goodness. one of these permanently shadowed craters on purpose. And then we looked at the plume that came up from the permanently shadowed crater, and it was nearly pure water ice which oh, is incredible. Interesting. Um, but based on the other measurements that we have from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and another spacecraft called Lunar Prospector, we're not really sure how much is down there. The footprints of these spacecraft are very large. And so it could be parts per million water ice in a very large area, or it could be up to pure water ice in a very concentrated packet or pocket of this permanently shadowed crater. So. We want to send this spacecraft to the moon to figure out exactly where it is in those permanently shadowed craters. Well, and, and this is important to know because? Because we want to understand the geologic history of the moon. Like I said, the, the hydrogen is either implanted by solar wind right. or it's being implanted by passing asteroids or comets. And this will help us understand whether or not the hydrogen is there because the moon's pole has been wandering. You know, the moon was presumably formed from this impact uh, of, with the Earth. And so we were, the pole has been wobbling over geologic time. So this will help us explain that. The other cool thing is for this thing called in situ resource utilization. So we, we want to eventually figure out where the resources are in the solar system. And hydrogen's a pretty important one. 
So if we find that there's a lot of it buried in a particular spot in these permanently shadowed craters, we might want to send humans or robots to actually mine that water ice and help us get elsewhere in the solar system. I was going to say, so. it could be used as fuel, of exactly. other provisions, those yes. sorts of things. Precisely. That's yeah. a, um, this is ASU's first interplanetary mission, is it not? The, being led out of ASU, yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So uh, did, how did you... Uh, how did you get around proposing this to NASA? <laughs> uh, it, was, it, was, it was a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, fortunately, there are a lot of great planetary research, planetary science researchers at ASU. Mark, you've had Mark Robinson on, Jim mm -hmm. Bell's been on. Um, Jim Bell's a deputy PI on this mission. He's been helping me out a lot of his experience. And so I, I had a lot of connections that have been made through the department and through the school. Um, we're also part of a new space initiative at ASU where we're trying to partner with small business companies that are doing space research. And so that helped tremendously in this effort um, to make sure that we had all the, the partners that would be in place. That Actually, there are people doing space research on neutron detectors that could provide a neutron detector for us that would fit in this tiny box. So uh, there are all sorts of partnerships that we made, um, and ASU was integral to that. School of Earth and Space has a long history. Um, so I, I, had, I really I feel like I was building on the shoulders of a, of a bunch of successes at ASU already. In, indeed, this is like the third major NASA project with ASU this year, correct? Yes, I believe so, so, yes. So things are happening <laughs> yes. over there. And, and last thing about these CubeSats now, we talked about the fact that this, this, really could, this, this could really change the nature of space exploration, we could hope it so. not? We hope so, yeah. Like I was saying, the costs are lower. We can accept a little bit greater risk. Um, we're hoping to not take as many risks, but we're going to have to accept some at, at this price point. Um, but we, what we really want to happen is see these spacecraft, the very targeted science investigations, riding along on the main missions. So they're, they're not posing any risk to the main mission themselves, and they're actually enhancing the science of these main large missions that are going out all over the solar system. And eventually, once we show that this is successful, maybe we can send 100 CubeSats to different places in the solar system and you know, basically triple, quadruple the number of science experiments that we're doing out there and the discovery that'll happen. So it's really about exploration and, and discovery and of the solar system. So. It almost has a drone feel to it here on Earth, doesn't it? Like a little plane instead of a big plane going little, out and doing things a big plane can't do. A little bit, yes, yeah. exactly. Well, yeah. congratulations on this Thanks and so uh, good luck with the project and we'll be keeping an eye on you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Tonight's edition of Arizona Giving and Leading looks at childhood hunger. The Arizona Fair Share Education Fund today released a new report, Childhood Hunger in America's Suburbs, the Changing Geography of Poverty. Here with the details is Arizona Fair Share's Chris Destish. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here. Um, geography of U.S. childhood hunger is changing. Explain, please. Yes. Um, so basically, from the time of the Great Recession, as we like to call it, up until now, um, the location and concentration of hunger and poverty has been shifting. Um, you, we traditionally think of it, I know when I was a kid, I actually didn't even think of it as something that applied to America, but it really does. Uh, usually we traditionally think of it as something that affects urban areas and maybe rural communities, but increasingly it's moving into the suburbs, into the working class um, since uh, about 2008. So, so, so it's increasing in the suburbs over towns and rural areas. Why? Uh, there's a number of ideas about why. A big thing was the Great Recession. It just, it knocked, especially in Phoenix, it knocked people out of their jobs. A lot of people were buying houses that they really couldn't afford, uh, not through any fault of their own, uh, subprime mortgages. And it, the, the end result was that a lot of parents were having to choose between, you know, paying their utility bill and uh, putting food on the table. 
And we're talking two times increase as opposed to yeah. urban areas and, and rural areas. Yeah, exactly. Um, in the Phoenix metro area, actually, since 2000, there's been a 16% increase in food insecurity among strictly suburban children. So, uh, I mean, there's so many ways you can go with this. Well, the impact of just the increasing number of poor people in America, how does that factor into all this? Oh, uh, majorly. Um, Brandeis University actually released uh, an independent study showing that due to food insecurity, specifically among children, uh, we're losing about $167 billion of economic productivity. And that's due to things like uh, preventable health care costs, um, lost economic productivity, uh, job loss, uh, poor education outcomes, so more money going into education that shouldn't be needed, really. Um, but the main idea is that when kids don't eat, when they're hungry, they don't pay attention, they have trouble listening in school. And if they're not listening, they're not learning. And if they're not learning, they struggle in school. And if they struggle in school, they struggle in life. I was going to say, back to the suburb aspect of this, uh, I would imagine a lot of folks in the suburbs think, yeah, hunger's a problem. Somewhere else, though, not here. Did that factor into this as well? Oh, yes, definitely. The main goal of uh, Fair Share's uh, childhood hunger campaign is to show people that hunger is not something that is far off. It's something that's in really every American community now, and that it's not something that someone else should deal with. We should all come together as an American community to deal with the issue. I know in the conclusion of your report, you write that the perceptions of childhood hunger need to change. Explain. Exactly. Um, so the perception is that it's just an urban, an urban phenomenon, that it doesn't exist in the suburbs where we live, like our neighborhood. But really, it does. People who are food insecure, often there's, there's pride that goes along with it, don't want to admit that they're not being fed properly. Kids don't want to admit that. Uh, they don't want to admit that they use SNAP and WIC and, you know, the National School Lunch Program, which are really great programs uh, that need funding. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a touchy subject. And as far as policies that need to change as well, what do you got in mind? Well, there's, there's a lot of, like, in, in Phoenix particularly, there's a lot of really great nonprofit work. Uh, St. Mary's uh, Food Bank Alliance does a lot, but it's just private interests are not enough to cover the issue. Um, so what we need is just uh, more funding for these programs and uh, increased access to them. Let's talk about some of these programs. Uh, the National School Lunch Program, it's a $12.6 billion program. Is it getting the job done? Um, it is in a lot of cases, but um, because of the kind of strict requirements for the program itself, um, a lot of people who need it don't, don't qualify. School breakfast program, that's $3.5 billion right there. Is that effective? Is it working? It's very effective, actually. Um, I just, uh, one of the speakers at my news conference this morning uh, talked about how she had a child, when she worked uh, back in the 90s uh, for a public school, she had a child that would come to her and ask her for food almost every single day because he just wasn't getting fed. And uh, the um, program went into place, basically, and um, He's excelling at school now. He's not falling asleep during class. He's a fourth grader now. Yeah. Um, she, she recently moved to Educare Arizona, which is this new um, pretty, pretty fancy uh, childhood education facility. It's really great. Um, but yeah, back when she was at the public schools, uh, poverty and just hunger was rampant among the kids. Um, and she couldn't do anything about it. Like she didn't have enough money to to feed all these children. Yeah. So these and programs are really important. You mentioned SNAP, the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. That gets 79, close to $80 billion. Um, we've only got about 30 seconds or so left. If, if you want folks to understand one thing about childhood hunger in America, in Arizona, what do they need to know? Well, specifically in Arizona, the, the rates of childhood hunger are 28%. Uh, that means that almost one in three kids is going every night has the possibility of going to sleep hungry. Um, and as, as I stated earlier, $167 billion lost. Mm -hmm. So if, if we can put money in at the beginning, we'll, we'll get money out in the end. All right. It's good to have you here. Thanks for yeah, joining great us. Great to be here. Thank you.
Friday on Arizona Horizon, it's the Journalists Roundtable. We'll discuss the latest intrigue involving the Corporation Commission and the Secretary of State gets involved in Arizona's legislative redistricting maps. Those stories and more on the Journalists Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. ASU's Ira A. Fulton Schools of Engineering strive to advance research, education, and industry to transform our economy. Ideas, talent, and technology for Arizona. You can learn more at engineering.asu.edu. Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust committed to changing lives and strengthening community through investments in nonprofits and strategic initiatives. More information at pipertrust.org.